Hi! In this video, we're going to begin our study of the systematic treatment of equilibrium. Now, there are going to be three videos in this series, and this first one is how to set up your equations for the systematic treatment of equilibrium. So when I talk about equilibrium, a lot of times people think about problems like this. And this is actually a problem I do with my general chemistry students. And you can see the steps on how to work these problems over on the left. And the first one is to make an ice table. So this is probably how you remember doing equilibrium problems. So if you look more closely at this problem, what you'll notice is that this is a gas phase problem where we set up a system and we basically put in the reactants into a sealed container and then you know we let it go and figure out what the concentrations are when they all stop. So this is a very tightly controlled system and the problem is that in a lot of what we do, a lot of real world chemistry, most of these systems aren't as tightly controlled. Equilibrium in really complex systems ends up being really complicated to calculate. And so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about how to set up a system of equations that is solvable, that will help us solve for many different sorts of chemical species in one system. First of all, this is not written in any book that I have seen so far, but it really helps if you just sit and think about your system. Start off by thinking about what sort of reactions might happen in your system. We're going to go into more detail on this later. Then what you're going to do is you're going to list all of the species. So every possible chemical substance that you're going to have to account for when you do equilibrium calculations. So for example, if you're doing an aqueous system, you generally don't put water in there as a species. And if you think about that, that's because when we write our equilibrium constants, we don't include water in that, you know, it's a pure solid, pure liquid. So we're not actually listing all of the species that are present. We're talking about all of the species that would go into an equilibrium constant. And then what you're going to do is you're going to write a bunch of equations. The first one you're going to write is what we call a charge balance equation. And again, I'm going to go through all of these in detail in a little bit. The next sort of equation that you're going to write, you're, you may end up writing more than one of these, is you're going to write what we call a mass balance equation. And then the last type of equation that you're going to write down are any sort of equilibrium constants that apply to this system. And what you're going to do at the end is you're going to count up how many equations you've generated and see if it's the same number as the number of unknown concentrations that you have. So remember in algebra, when you're solving for X number of unknowns, you have to have that very same number X of equations. And so that's what we're trying to do here is generate that many equations. So let's go through some of those steps a little more closely. First of all, what sort of reactions might happen? First of all, if you're dealing with an aqueous solution, one thing you always need to think about is the dissociation of water, basically water splitting to form H plus and OH minus. That's especially important if you have things like acid or base reactions going on which by the way is the next sort of reaction you might want to think about because H plus concentrations and OH minus concentrations are going to be affected by the dissociation of water in addition to dissociation of acid or ionization of base. The next thing that you need to think about is are you putting any ionic compounds into the system? Because as you know, if ionic compounds are soluble, they're going to dissociate in solution and then you're going to end up with those ions in solution. And then the last thing that I'm just going to pretty well brush over in these three videos is complexation reactions. And the reason I'm brushing over that is basically because we haven't covered those yet, but we will add those all in to the big picture in a few weeks. So remember the first sort of reaction I told you to make is a charge balance reaction. So what does this mean? So if you remember back when we first learned about ionic compounds, we talked about how in the formation of ionic compounds, you have to put in the right number of anions so that the negative charge balances the positive charge on the cation. And this is basically the same thing, except on a much more massive scale. When your teacher originally introduced you to ionic compounds, you were thinking about it on a 
molecular scale and now we are thinking about it on a systemic scale. So we're thinking about it in terms of moles and usually the way that we account for all this stuff is in terms of concentration. What is the molar concentration of a particular sort of ion. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to look at mass balance equations. These tend to break down into one of two types. The first is a known species input from one or more sources. So for example, one or more sources, let's look at a two source system. So if you have 0.5 molar NaCl in a system and also 0.5 molar calcium chloride in a system, then you're getting chloride ions from two different sources as these ionic compounds dissociate. First you have 0.5 molar chloride from NaCl and one molar from calcium chloride. So it's half a molar of calcium chloride, but there's two chloride ions in every calcium chloride, so we double it. Our total chloride input then is the concentration of sodium chloride that we added plus twice the concentration of calcium chloride. And again, that twice is because there are two chlorides in every molecule of calcium chloride. The other time you have to think about a mass balance equation is if you're putting something in and that can break apart into a bunch of different things. And this is usually acid base, it doesn't have to be. It also could be complexation. So for example, if we made a half molar solution of hydrogen fluoride, which is a weak acid, some of that HF would lose a hydrogen and leave behind the conjugate base fluoride ion, right? So here we have the total amount of hydrogen fluoride in the system equals the concentration of the protonated acid plus the concentration of the conjugate base. So you originally put in 0.5 molar. Now, if you add up the concentration of the HF and the concentration of the F minus, that will still be 0.5. We don't know how it's distributed between those two yet. We'll figure that out. But that's an, those are the two examples of mass balance. And again, the last sort of equations that we're gonna put in are these equilibrium constants. And let's think about the sort of reactions we were talking about. We talked about water dissociating. So of course we know that equilibrium constant. That's H plus times OH minus equals 10 to the minus 14th. Um, then we have acids or bases. So you could have a Ka or a Kb equation. And if you have something that's only sort of soluble, you might need to put in the Ksp. And of course, if you have complexation, you can put in those equilibrium constants as well. So I'm gonna walk you through a couple of problems and keep in mind, we are just talking about setup in this video. And so I'm not gonna solve for any of these concentrations yet, but don't worry because that's what the next video is gonna be about. So in this problem, we are taking half a mole of pure acetic acid and we're going to dilute it to one liter of water. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna find the concentrations of everything at equilibrium. So if you remember, the first thing we have to think about is think about what sort of reactions might be happening in the system. Now, naturally, um, we have an aqueous system because we diluted it with water. And so we can put the dissociation of water as a reaction that's happening. Also, since it's acetic acid, we have acidic dissociation, right? We have acetic acid dissociating to form a proton and acetate. And so from this, we can list all of the species. And we do this by going through the reactions that we just wrote down and finding what's in there. Okay, so there's water, we're gonna skip the water, right? As I said before, that doesn't factor into any of our equilibrium constants or anything like that. We have OH minus, we have H plus in two of these reactions. Uh, we have acetic acid, the protonated form. And then of course we have acetate, the conjugate base. So now we have four species here. Now, the next thing we need to do is write a charge balance equation. And so what we're gonna do here is we're going to look at our reactions and we're gonna look for anything that has a negative charge. And we have two of those there. We have OH minus and we have acetate ions. So that's gonna go on one side of our equation. And 
those have got to add up to our positively charged thing, which is H plus. So the H plus concentration has to equal the OH minus concentration plus the acetate concentration. Okay, now we're gonna write mass balance equations. So there are two possibilities, of course, that I mentioned before, and one of those is that an input species can dissociate into multiple species. Well, we've only put one thing in, acetic acid. Can that dissociate? Yeah, it can. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're going to look and we're gonna see that um, our total acetic acid concentration is going to be the concentration of protonated acid, protonated acetic acid, plus the concentration of the acetate ion, so this is the unprotonated acid form, or the conjugate base form. Okay, and that has to add up to the total that we put in before, which is 0.5 molar, because remember, we diluted um, the acid to one liter and we put in 0.5 moles. Okay, so now we get to write our equilibrium constants. And you can see by looking at our reactions that we have two different reactions and therefore we're gonna have two equilibrium constants. And so the first one is gonna be the dissociation of water. And the second one is going to be the Ka expression for acetic acid. And you can look up the Ka in the back of your book. Actually, you can just Google it too. It's pretty common acid. So there are our two equilibrium constants for our two reactions. Now let's double check. Do you, we have the same number of equations as the number of unknowns? And remember, we generated four unknowns, OH minus, H plus, acetic acid, acetate, four. We have our charge balance equation. We have one mass balance equation, and then we have two equilibrium constants. So we've got four. So we have set this up. We're ready to solve it, except that's not happening in this video. So we're gonna set up one more, and don't worry, we are going to take a stab at solving these in the next video. So this next one, we're gonna add sodium bicarbonate, which is basically just baking soda. Uh, we're gonna add sodium bicarbonate to one liter of water, um, 0.1 molar. Again, we start out by saying what reactions are happening in this system. And first of all, we're in water, so of course we're gonna have the dissociation of water. And the other thing is, we're putting sodium bicarbonate in. What is that gonna dissociate into? Well, it's an ionic compound. It's gonna make sodium and bicarbonate. Now, if you look this up, you'll discover that sodium bicarbonate is extremely soluble. Most of it is gonna dissolve in water. And so that's gonna make Na plus and HCO3 minus. And I, I wrote this as an equilibrium, but because it's very soluble, everything's gonna end up as sodium and bicarbonate. Well, now, let's notice something. We have bicarbonate in there and bicarbonate has a proton that can dissociate. And you can have an acid dissociation reaction where bicarbonate loses its proton to form carbonate. But bicarbonate is also the conjugate base of a weak acid, carbonic acid. And so we also have this possibility going on where the bicarbonate can nab a proton from the water and make carbonic acid. So we have four possible reactions. So this is definitely a more complicated system than the one that we previously did. Okay, so the next thing is to list all of the species. And so we're gonna go through these reactions one by one and pick out what we can find. Um, the first thing we see is OH minus. So same as last time, first thing is OH minus. And the next thing we have is H plus. You can see that we have that in three of our reactions. Uh, then we have sodium, ions. Then we also have bicarbonate, which of course pops up in three of the reactions as well. We have carbonate as well, and we have carbonic acid. So we have six, six different unknowns. Let's write our charge balance equation. And we have we're gonna have all of our negatives again on one side of the equation and equaling all of the positively charged things. Well, We've got a whole bunch more. Here we've got OH minus, we've got bicarbonate, and we have carbonate. Okay, so we've got three different uh, species that here that are negatively charged. And one thing that's different than last time is one of these things has a minus two charge on it. So we need to multiply that by two to account for the fact that it's got twice as much negative charge 
as the single negative charged ones. And so that's why we have the two in front of carbonate. Now, all of those charges have to equal the concentration of positive charges, which in this case, we've got two positively charged species this time. We've got H plus, as we did last time, and we also have Na plus. So those things are gonna be our positive charges. Next step is to write some mass balance equations. Usually when I am trying to write a mass balance equation, I look to see what I know the concentration of. That's the easiest way to identify if there's something that I can write mass balance for. I know that I'm adding 0.1 mole of sodium bicarbonate. So we're gonna have 0.1 molar sodium bicarbonate. And what that means is that we are going to end up with 0.1 molar of sodium and 0.1 molar of bicarbonate. Okay, so sodium's not gonna do anything. It's always gonna end up as a spectator ion and all these things. Um, so we're gonna have 0.1 molar sodium. Now, what about bicarbonate? Bicarbonate is quite possibly gonna end up participating in all of these reactions that I pointed out earlier. And so we're gonna have 0.1 molar bicarbonate at the start, and that will end up in one of several species. So we can say that the total amount of carbonic acid species, things that are related to carbonic acid, is going to be carbonic acid plus bicarbonate plus carbonate, and all of those are going to equal 0.1 molar. Okay, uh, the next thing that we need to do is we need to um, come up with our equilibrium constants. Um, so of course we start with the dissociation of water. In terms of solubility, we're assuming again that sodium bicarbonate is completely soluble, so we're not gonna throw in a KSP for that. We're just going to say it all dissolves. But then we also have two acid dissociation reactions here. Um, so we're gonna have two Ka expressions. One for the dissociation of carbonic acid, one for the dissociation of bicarbonate. And you can look up those Ka's again. Again, this is a very common weak acid, so you should be able to find the Ka pretty much anywhere. Now let's count up again, and you can see that we have one charge balance equation. We have two mass balance equations, um, and then we have dissociation of water and two acid dissociation equilibria expressions. And so we've got a total of six equations and we've got six unknowns. So we have set this up correctly. That seems really complicated and it is, but the fun is just beginning. <laughs> this is the thing, you can think of this as a puzzle. Like what all is gonna react with what if you throw a whole bunch of things in a, in a beaker. These are really important because it allows you to evaluate a complicated system. It's not hard to do equilibrium problems in gen chem. We do a lot of hand waving in general chemistry and say, oh, just approximate. Well, this is one thing that we can do to get actual concentrations for everything in a complicated system. And you can see how this is gonna tie into analysis because it helps us know what to expect in a system. I hope it was helpful and I look forward to seeing you again soon.